So welcome everyone to this evening Renaissance Lives podcast. Today is the Giorgione, Big George, as it means in Italian, whose dates are kind of uncertain. He was born around 1477 and he died in 1510 from the plague in Venice. But lots of him is a very uncertain to the point that even some people have doubted his existence. That's, for instance, Gabriele D'Annunzio, the Italian writer, who calls him more a myth than a human being. And it is at least true that Giorgione is a kind of myth who has conditioned the perception of Venetian art from the 19th century onwards. So there are really two issues which are related to a Giorgione in, a, in art history and in cultural history. There's attribution and interpretation. Attribution, because from the rediscovery of Giorgione towards the end of the 19th, towards the end of the 18th century, and throughout the 19th century, from this time to the present, the number of pictures attributed to him has decreased from about 200 pictures to only 10. And now there's the problem of interpretation because these 10 pictures or so, 10 pictures or so, have prompted so many diverging interpretation that what comes out is one of the most striking aspects of Giorgione, that is the ambiguity of his work, which is indeed the subject of the book, which we will discuss today and around which our conversation will develop. So to discuss this, to discuss Giorgione's ambiguity, it's a pleasure to be joined by the author, Tom Nichols, who is reader in the history of art at the University of Glasgow and has written extensively on Venetian art, as well as on the imagery of the peasants, of outcasts, poor and sick in the early modern era. And it's no less a pleasure to introduce and welcome Tom's interlocutor, Talia Allington Wood, who is lecturer in early modern art history at the Warburg Institute and convener of the MA in art history curatorship and Renaissance culture. Talia has written on early modern and contemporary art, including some much noticed work on the Sacro Bosco of Bomarzo, 16th century sculpture park, and she's currently co-editing a forthcoming volume on the elements of the on the elements in the Renaissance. And without further ado, Talia, if you want to start the conversation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Francois. And it's a real pleasure to be here. And it's a real pleasure in particular to be here um, to talk to Tom. I have my copy of the book here. It was a it was an excellent read. So I think um, maybe we'll pick up on exactly the um, issues that Francois mentioned there in his introduction, which is that it's very difficult to pin Giorgione down. There's, a, this, there's an excellent quote on Giorgione that we don't know anything about him except that he's everywhere. And so perhaps my first question to you, Tom, is really about the challenges of writing a book on an artist on which so little is concretely known and in, in which or to whom kind of works are being attributed away from. You describe him wonderfully as a disappearing artist at one point. Um, so, and yet at the same time, an awful lot has been written on Giorgione. So maybe you could speak to that to sort of start us off, how you approached writing about Giorgione. Well, good evening, everyone. And many thanks to the Warburg for hosting this and inviting me to come. So just to say that before I attempt to answer that. Um, Yes, um, I suppose, well, I suppose that that was my first thought when um, kind of invited to write this book. Um, how can one actually start to construct uh, something when everything seems to be falling apart um, with this artist? Now, clearly, Giorgione has got a massive, massive reputation going right back to the 16th century, I think. Yeah, he's there in Vasari's lives in first and second edition. Um, and, you know, since that point, from that point onwards, he is um, constantly referred to uh, by other artists and uh, by writers. Uh, and yet, over the last uh, century or so, the number of attributions, as Francois has already said, has, has uh, gone in the wrong direction. Uh, other artists seem to be getting more and more paintings. In particular, Titian, who seemed to get quite a lot of Giorgione's paintings in the last <coughs> uh, decades. Uh, including some really key works, uh, you know, the Concert Champêtre in, in the Louvre is probably the most famous example of a painting that was always Giorgione until maybe only the last few decades, most scholars are now thinking that's by Titian. So there's my, my challenge straight away, and I kind of uh, 
after the 2016 uh, exhibition in the Royal Academy, The Age of Giorgione, um, a number of scholars, including Charles Hope, um, really kind of thought that um, studies of Giorgione had kind of come to a stop, come to a halt. There wasn't really much that could be said, given the radical uncertainty about his oeuvre and just how few paintings there were left uh, to this artist. So to what extent, as uh, Denuncio said, is he a myth, always a myth? Um, so, you know, that was the challenge at the beginning, to try and build um, back from that in some kind of way. It, it's a small book, it's 60,000 words, and I realised that I wasn't going to uh, be dealing with attributional questions uh, primarily in this book. I had to kind of make a choice as to what I thought maybe by Georgiani and what I thought probably wasn't. And I think in the book I've discussed all the works that I think are by him, uh, and it is very few. Uh, there are quite a number that we know from the written sources uh, or from prints that could be added to that, but we are looking at a small number of works. So what is it, if you return to those small number of works, what do they have in common? What kind of features do they, do they have in common? Um, and the more I looked at that, then the more I thought, well, maybe the thing that they have in common is that they this, this quality of suggestiveness, but also of elusiveness, that mm. every work that seemed to be still by possibly Giorgione was not clear. And, and maybe, was, yes, go ahead. Well, I'll just say, and maybe kind of based on that, we can begin this discussion um, about a self-portrait that we have, so one of yeah. the first texts. So maybe you can introduce us also to this ambiguity and to Giorgione through this portrait that we're looking at here. Yeah, it's what, it's what I started with, uh, it's the work I started with. Here's a self-portrait that you might have thought, well, okay, this is going to clarify things for us. Um, I mean, it's, it's straight away a very unusual work. It's very ruined, it's cut, it's a fragment, it's not in a very good state at all. Um, the image you've got to the right here is uh, an etching by, made in 1650 by Wenceslas Holler, uh, who saw uh, this portrait probably in Brussels. Um, the, the middle image is the original painting. Are they very closely connected? Well, the scholarship says that they are to some extent. I've gone with that. Um, the painting itself was possibly the first independent self-portrait to be made in Venice. So that seemed to me, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I don't know of any other independent self-portraits mm. um, made in this great city of art. Uh, what does it show us? It shows us a young artist. The feeling is, is, is uneasy, isn't it? It's, it's, it's slightly confrontational, the raised chin, the, 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 the creased brows. Um, it's not a kind of easy painting. Is he David? Well, the, the, the etching, uh, if we go back out again, Francois, the etching to the right tells us that, yes, uh, that he could once have been David, and this is a truncated portrait. We've lost the lower, the lower bit with the head. There's blood trickling down the outside of the parapet. It's half a self-portrait. It's, it's half a religious image to some extent, or at least a, an allegory maybe, and it's David and Goliath. So what is, what, what kind of, what is um, Giorgione doing here? Showing us this, uh, showing us this image of himself as a biblical hero. Um, you know, it's not quite straightforwardly a self-portrait. There's a kind of disguise. And that disguising, I think, is again, you know, led me into this idea that maybe the key thing about Giorgione was his desire to kind of be ambiguous. If we go to the left, we see a, 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 a another print from the 17th century after a lost work by Giorgione. Uh, and here I think he's disguising himself again, this time in classical guise rather than Christian guise. It's, it's, um, it's him as Orpheus with his wife Eurydice being dragged off uh, or to hell in the background there. And he's got a, a musical instrument on his lap. Um, so, you know, Giorgione is Orpheus, Giorgione is David, again, other identities fashioning his identity in, in, in oblique ways. Um, maybe, too, in this, I detected a degree of ambiguity, possibly even a kind of sexual undercurrent. Um, 
and um, a kind of challenge to, you know, ideas about the artist as a powerful man. These are kind of less apparent, but in my book, I slightly kind of argue that Giorgione is introducing uh, homo homoerotic elements um, in, in these works. Yes, I was particularly um, struck by, in a way, the, the kind of shift that might have happened in your in your approach to writing in this book. You, you've kind of mentioned in a in another text you've written that you previously thought of your research as sort of contextualist and historicist, whereas here, because of the ambiguity really around Giorgione, it's the yeah. paintings themselves that become yeah. the evidence. And yeah, that, that's, that's so great. Thank you for, for, for prompting that because I I think it did kind of mean that I had to focus in on a smaller number of works very closely and find most of my evidence within the works, which is, and oh, I mean, it's not formalism as such, but I think it's only by paying very close attention to the details in these paintings that you get close to what they, they mean. Um, this is another work um, from the same kind of period, I think, of Giorgione's career quite early on, but also involves decapitation, Freud had, connected decapitation with castration. Um, uh, we needn't necessarily push that point, but the smilingness of these heads struck me. Uh, the fact of kind of pleasurable death at the hands of uh, a sexualized woman um, who is also, you know, potentially still Judith and very much like a figure of justice you know, from a kind of moralizing perspective. Um, the way George Henry paints, the fluidity of his paint struck me straight away. Um, it's the oil technique, and in what, some ways this is, you know, Venetian colorito at its, at its most kind of expressive, um, but, um, you know, there's, a, there's kind of ambiguities, formal ambiguities in many of these works too, which, um, which when you look closely at them, they don't kind of reveal quite what you'd think. Um, you know, yeah. she's here, a very beautiful woman. I love the bling. I love the, the softness of the of the kind of hair escaping from the sides, that, that juxtaposition of, of flesh and hair, which Giorgio only seems to return to quite a lot. Well, that, yeah, I think this gets to another really central kind of theme mm. that runs through your book and your discussion of Giorgione. So is both kind of technique and the textures or the surface of the canvas as very sensual. And as part of that, the way that the senses and the body is thematized in his work. You know, I think the work, mm. the works we've seen so far, the self-portrait, where if he is holding the head of Goliath, you talk so evocatively about the fingers in the hair. Mm. Again, if mm. he's Orpheus, you have sound. And again, here, the, the foot touching, yeah. um, touching the decapitated head at the bottom there. Um, so do you want to say something about kind of the role yeah, of sensation? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a theme that started to occur to me in a way it stands out. Like, what do you mean when something's ambiguous? And I started to think about the relation of that to the sensuality of these pictures, which seemed to be the very thing that took Giorgione to some extent beyond uh, Bellini or made him different from many other uh, Venetian artists to this point. Um, what does, you know, this, we're, we're, we're straying into the territory of the senses, so I'm aware that Francois is a great expert on this, but um, this, this is a kind of somatic kind of art. It's an art about feelings and sensuality in which the viewer kind of moves very close to the image. I think there's a new kind of relationship between the viewer and the image being proposed even in these early works. Um, so I suppose all the way through my book, there's this theme of um, the, the way in which he engages sound, touch, texture, um, and, uh, you know, he, he even tastes open mouth sometimes. Uh, he, will, he will kind of introduce the full panoply of the senses into these works. And I, yeah, I, then I thought about the scholarship, which seemed to always intellectualize Giorgione, always want to make him a, a learned painter. And I wondered whether that had not been exaggerated to some extent, just in the kind of vacuum uh, of a, a kind of convincing interpretation. So look, turning back to the paintings and seeing them as these uh, extraordinarily sensual works, uh, that was what I pursued. Yeah, I think that it's um, you know something that's so interesting that crops that kind of comes out through your book is also the importance of questioning the historiography of literature as well of sort of why have these mate why why are there these kind of met kind of master narratives around certain artists where have they come from are they actually bound into the 
the kind of agendas of scholarship at the time, very much so, maybe we'll come to it later, but mm. in the desire to really pin down a meaning to Giorgione's paintings. But I think we'll get to that um, later, maybe yeah. when we look at some other paintings. So here we're now moving um, into your, the sort of next chapter of your book where we're dealing with kind of context and religious works. Um, so maybe you can quickly introduce the paintings that we're looking at and then we'll, we'll um, talk about Yeah, them. well, this is the Adoration of the Magi in the National Gallery. It's the smallest painting, uh, very, very laterally shaped. It was almost certainly either a predella of an altarpiece or a, a maybe decorated a piece of furniture. It's a small scale work. One of a number of these have been introduced, uh, kind of attributed to Giorgione for many years. Um, I, yes, um, I, I kind of uh, maintain this. Quite a few others I'm not so, I'm more skeptical about of these small uh, early paintings by Giorgione. So I'm quite severe, a bit like Charles Hope. I'm, I'm very skeptical of a lot of the attributions. I went to see the ones in the Uffizi and I wasn't happy with those. Um, what's interesting in this painting, what makes it Giorgione for me is just this kind of, particularly these two figures that um, Francois is obsessively <laughs> focusing <laughs> in on. <laughs> buttocks and the cod, cod piece and the, the, the knife stuck, <laughs> stuck towards the buttocks. Those two figures in that lovely contrapposto kind of dance, um, I think um, for me uh, are very are very much like Georgian. Also it's a strange painting, the way in which it kind of, those figures on the right, very worldly, very sensual, possibly members of the Campagna del Calci, the, these, these kind of uh, groups of young men in Venice, possibly that's who they are, very contemporary looking and, and centrally presented again. Mm. The way in which they contrast with what's going on on the left side um, is, is strange because it's as if Giorgione wants our eye to move between these, uh, this very kind of isolated, inward, introspective depiction of the Virgin and Child, uh, 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 on the left, um, as if they're kind of wholly unaware of this, you know, kind of worldly spectacle that's going on in the right, on the right. Um, I find that very interesting. I think the eye, you know, is, is moved colouristically with these blues and uh, the Rialga, uh, yellow-orange of the Rialga pigment used across on both sides. Um, is is a kind of something he this juxtaposition of something immediate, sensual, contemporary, with something um, that's 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 different from that is is typical of Giorgione. So I, I kind of this is you know this is an early work. I don't think it's a you know all the painting is is fabulous, um, but it's one of the things about the early Giorgione is he's you know his definition of anatomical form, his the positioning of figures in space is quite suspect, isn't it, at times? Um, it's not altogether convincing. Um, um, does that mean it's not Giorgione? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it probably just means it could be him, you know, and that's one of the things that he's not so interested in. Well, the, I think the what's, what's of value that, that you're doing is, you know, you're not dismissing what's not necessarily successful in the paintings. You're saying, well, let's read into them and question kind of why or what what might that presentation or the lack yes. of interest in anatomy be doing to the atmosphere of the... What the other things is it allowing you to do? Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, it, it opens up. I mean, if we look at the one on the right now, which is probably a similar kind of time, and um, this is in Washington, uh, the Little Holy Family, sometimes known as the Benson, the one of that, um, similar to me, similarly, um, there's lots of problems with the anatomy of these figures. If you look around the area of Joseph's knee, for example, or uh, where quite he's sitting, you know, and where she's sitting, uh, is is she totally in front of him? Um, yes, possibly it, she is, but what's she sitting on? How these figures relate to this very strange kind of landscape that they're setting, um, oddly empty. And then straight away, the ambiguity begins to creep in. What are we looking at here? What's the iconography of this? Is mm. it a holy family? Well, okay, it could, it, it seems that it is a holy family. Is it a rest on the flight into Egypt? Is it a nativity? If it had a nativity, if it was a nativity, then we'd have animals, surely. We'd have a stable. Where are these, uh, where are the, the holy family here? And uh, uh, you know, this, if it is a holy family, well, that's not a topic, that's not a subject that Bellini um, Bellini painted. It's very Bellini-esque in some ways, this, but there are enough 
elements in this, all of them quite ambiguous, actually, that, 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 that suggest to me that it is Giorgione. I mean, I particularly love that little jutting foreground uh, bit that comes out of, of, the, of, the, of that stone ledge in the background. I don't know why I like it. It's just so comforting that the way in which this, it provides an armature. If we go to the, I have to go to the left, really, um, other way kind of thing, <laughs> other side. Yeah. It's getting there. There it is. <laughs> it's not much, I know. Um, and there's, there's a little twig. Oh, we've lost it. Oh, we'll get it back. We'll get it back. Yes. I was enjoying that. There's a few details in there which yes. may suggest something more iconogra iconographically interesting and a little um, twig. So maybe, maybe what I'll ask you now then is, um, you yeah. know, and we've we've discussed this before, but you yeah. know, in this chapter, you talk very much about how this lack of clarity or the slippage of meaning is something mm. that, on the one hand, has been a long part of Venetian tradition, but yet at the same time, Giorgione is still a departure from that. So maybe could you? Yeah. Um, can you tell us about what you see, how you see him situated within the tradition, but then also where he's doing something? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to have it both ways. Yeah. <laughs> um, in one sense, I'm trying to say, I suppose, that this degree of iconographic slippage, slippage this emphasis on what Francois is calling painting, this, this kind of fluidity in the making of a painting, that oil painting, you know, encouraged to some extent with its, 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 its freedom of correction. Um, that's one aspect of the Venetian tradition, I think, and David Rosand in his book Myths of Venice showed that very well. He called it semantic slippage, a bit, maybe a bit hyperfluting, but, you know, this idea that to some extent the idea evolved, the idea of a painting evolved as you painted it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a kind of ambiguity was kind of built into this entire tradition of Venice, which would possibly have been less so um, elsewhere. Um, we're now looking at... Um, uh, the Castelfranco uh, uh, Madonna by Giorgione. Again, it's really his only larger scale altarpiece, and it's not very big. Uh, and this he made in his hometown of Castelfranco. Um, it's um, um, yeah, it's 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 a work that um, you know really in terms of things like perspective um, is 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 kind of again quite a strange picture when you look at it and if you look at it against this masterpiece of perspective on the right which is uh, Giovanni Bellini's uh, San Giobbe altarpiece um, you you might just think well Giorgione just can't do it he's really not very good at linear perspective and the bodies look a bit elongated and boneless for some reason um, they don't seem to have you know there's not many there's not much anatomy in there um, uh, the Virgin looks very small and slightly uncommanding, and she's very high up in the space. But, you know, these kind of ambiguities also lead the poetry of this altarpiece. They lead us into the poetry of this altarpiece. It's the kind of str the strangeness of it that is, uh, is in a way, most appealing. Um, and I find it, uh, you know, those kind of um, those kind of elements of, of not hanging together, if you like, that, that give it its, its poetic effect. Uh, Bellini is a master in terms of, you know, constructing the space. The ambiguity of the tradition, he's kind of more or less cancelled it by this point. I think in the later 15th century, Venetian art really does uh, reach some superb heights of, you know, illusionism and naturalism um, with the kind of complexities of that, uh, in fact. Look at the way in which we're looking up in Bellini from a very low perspective. This was something that Francois was pointing out, uh, that it's a much, got a much lower viewpoint. It's coherent with a viewer placed at the bottom edge of the painting uh, at very highest. Whereas with Giorgione, we're kind of looking in from this strange perspective. The, the, the vanishing point is maybe somewhere in the, the region of the Virgin's legs. It's very high by comparison. It's for a private chapel, and I spoke, think in my book in the end, I kind of argued that this was a work that was essentially kind of privatised around maybe an individualised spectator, and this could have been Tuzio Costanzo, uh, the, the, the Sicilian soldier, follower of Caterina Conaro in the Marco Trevigiana near, near to Castelfranco. Um, there's a lot of argument as to whether we're seeing a kind of a, a kind of project that, that was encouraged by the death of this man's son in 1504. Uh, I've gone for an earlier date. Uh, I'm not sure we 
we, we quite can prove this. Um, but uh, yeah, yes, fantastic uh, depiction of the armor there. I'm just wondering at these fantastic details using the, the PowerPoint. Uh, who, is, who are we looking at though? Who is that soldier exactly? Is it mm. San Liberalis? Is it, you know, is it St. George? Um, is it San Nicosia? It could be all three of these different, these saints uh, rolled into one. Maybe it doesn't matter too closely who it is uh, um, to, to the patron or indeed to the, the painter. Once you've just mentioned too, this, <laughs> This kind of arrangement, as if this was a private devotional picture, with this um, this this kind of balcony um, um, effect, with a kind of um, a landscape in the background. Now, landscapes had appeared in earlier altarpieces, of course, but this softly painted landscape with more soldiers in it, as we're seeing, uh, and a ruined fort to the left, uh, is is again a, a kind of a, a kind of admittance of really the local world, I think, of Tuzio Costanzo into this institutional domain of the altarpiece. Yes, and, and in relation to that, because I think it's so key, you know, you focus very much on the paintings themselves, but equally important is actually this kind of small elite circle of individuals who favour and and kind of are patrons to Giorgione as well, yes. and and how really it's about the sort of cultural consciousness that they have that you think really feeds into the what makes the, these paintings so individual as it were um yes i mean this was really i mean i'm relying to some extent on the original scholarship here or the, the existing scholarship we've got a small number of patrons in in venice mm. uh, including gabriele vendramin tadio contarini girolamo marcello um, and we, we, we think that these paintings, at least some of these paintings, were made for a fairly small but elite circle in Venice. Now, Giorgiani would have been to some extent an outsider to Venice. He's from Castelfranco. He might have been there till he was in his mid-20s. It's not quite clear according to which documents you believe. Um, but he was for some time outside the, the structure in Venice. But his, his patronage when he gets there is very elite. Uh, and I think that's interesting. Um, these are very bespoke paintings and the kind of ambiguities that we see in them, in a sense, reflect back to the kind of patrons, the kind of viewers that he was anticipating. Uh, he could take a lot for granted. The paintings themselves seem to take a lot of, for granted. Sometimes they're not so kind of literal, as it were, as some other artists work. And I wonder whether also in a funny way that kind of narrowness of his patronage leads him beyond the kind of norms. Now, that's kind of a weird thing to say because in a way you'd think it wouldn't. If he's just being very elite, then why would he move in a way towards the margins? But it's also true that there's a number of images by Giorgione which include kind of people towards the margins of society, mm. people who are outsiders. Yeah, uh, and it seems to be a theme. And maybe as we get to that, we're being sort of prompted by the PowerPoint to move yeah. on to think about <laughs> portraits and portrait types. And I think that as we think about the portraits, you know, you, yeah. you call that chapter heading portraits and portrait types, which yeah. really, again, kind of says in itself the ambiguity around yeah. Giorgio Ne's paintings, because we're dealing with a number that read like portraits or they're portrait like, but they're not necessarily straightforward portraits. Yeah. But we'll turn first to the ones on this slide here, which maybe are the more... Um, easily yes. recognizable portraits that we find yes. of George Onay. Um, very controversial, maybe... go on, yeah, sorry, yes. go on. No, you know, carry on, you talk us through. Well, I mean, they're very controversial right. because of course the one on the left is thought by many people to be by, uh, not by, by George Onay at all, but Charles Hope uh, mm. <laughs> dismissed this as, as, George, as George Onay. I think it probably is George Onay, but it is very different from the painting on the right, which is the terrace portrait in San Diego. Uh, there are, there's probably five or six years between them. I think the difference is that by the time you get to the terrace portrait on the right, uh, Giorgione has experienced uh, one, Leonardo, and two, Jura. <laughs> so, yes. you know, these, these, this has transformed uh, his art. Uh, and so there is room enough uh, in looking at both of these. I think they're his two main commission portraits. Um, the two on the right you're seeing is a kind of typical George, uh, Bellini, sorry, Giovanni Bellini portrait of a man, um, and in a way giving you the idea of what official portraiture in Venice was like in the later 15th century, around 1500. And if you go back across to the terrace portrait to its left, you see just how 
uh, how very different uh, Giorgione's approach is. We're right up close to this uh, sitter. Uh, his, his kind of presence is almost palpable. Um, you know, he, he's almost touching the front of the picture. He's, he fills the space. And yet, when you look into his eyes, you see sadness, you see the degree of, uh, of self-doubt, maybe something uh, uh, inward reflective. Uh, he isn't a kind of... Uh, a, a kind of happy servant of the state, um, which is what you know Bellini is showing in his official portrait. It's an unofficial picture of aging, and I think you know you can see the painting on the far right there, which is very close to it. I don't think it's the same sitter. The noses are very similar, the mouths are very similar, but this is by Dura, dated fifteen oh six. Um, surely Giorgione has seen this uh, and then kind of responded to it. This painting, that in fact, was in the, the Vendramin collection uh, alongside the Tempest and Contempo. So it's, it's very likely that Giorgione has laid eyes on this and kind of responded to it in his own version. And you can also make some distinctions between those paintings, because in a way, look how much closer up um, Giorgione has moved us. Um, the other yes. great figure is Leonardo, right? Yes. Uh, and in we'll this, come this to him. One yes. of his Leonardesk, most yes. Leonardesk paintings. And I sort of um, maybe just kind of, mm. if we could, well, we're now moving on to a very Leonardesk painting, but if we just pause quickly on this, I think that I'd like to ask, ask you about um, your thoughts on Giorgione so often being linked to other artists. You know, you use a lot of comparisons in your book. Um, yeah. You mentioned Bellini, Dura. We do get onto the Leonardo and Leonardesk, which we'll also talk about in a second, but I think mm -hmm. you acknowledge their influence, but you also seem very keen to assert Giorgione's independence um, from them as well. So it's mm -hmm. the degree to which we sort of have to acknowledge, but it's also useful um, to distinguish Giorgione, or also maybe how, particularly within Leonardesque, has it, has it undermined our understanding of Giorgione somewhat through always referring back to these other artists. And I think, you know, the, the origins of, of, of the Leonardo uh, Giorgione um, link were Vasari. <laughs> so, you know, Vasari, um, you know, says that more or less Giorgione is a creato of, 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 of Leonardo. He couldn't have existed without Leonardo. And when you see these forms emerging out of the dark, you know, this formato at the edges of the forms, uh, the softness of the painting, um, and you start thinking, oh, yes, well, Leonardo is, is also ambiguous. All art is ambiguous. <laughs> of course it is. You know? <laughs> we wouldn't want it to be anything different. Um, but is, you know, there's a kind of performance of, of ambiguity, which is what I think I'm trying to get at. It's a performative mm. thing within the field of painting where less is more. Now, that was something that Leonardo himself teaches. Uh, we yes. know that from the notebooks. Less is more, right? Um, the less you visually give, the more the, the, the more the viewer will have to give. And so to some extent, you know, um, we can see that when we go into the, the details of these paintings. This is possibly, the young man with the arrow is possibly his most Leonardesque work. Yes. Um, say, for early, earlier, um, earlier when we were talking, I yes, think it's, it's based on the John the Baptist to some yes. extent, or yes. uh, you know, that's that's the key thing. But you know, this isn't John the Baptist. Who is it exactly? Mm. Is it is it is it is it a sacred painting? Is it Saint Sebastian with his arrow? Uh, is it uh, is it Eros, the God of Love? Um, I tend to go for the the. The second there. Um, I think the differences between Leonardo and, and, uh, and Giorgione are very interesting and very hard to pinpoint. What I would say is that there's something more absolutely pictorial about Giorgione than there is about Leonardo. That Leonardo will um, complicate and complicate and complicate the interface between the artist and nature. Uh, he'll do that. Uh, and um, he will record the way in which a knot ties or the way in which water is, uh, is interrupted, uh, the flow of water, etc. He'll be interested in the physics of that. George Annie probably wasn't interested in those things. It was a more direct act uh, of um, subjective assertion. And this painting I find to be a deeply erotic painting. It's, it's a homoerotic painting. We're back to the theme I mentioned briefly at the outset of uh, it doesn't surprise me that it's Giorgione who's the one who's able to paint uh, such an extraordinary image. Who is it? We don't know. Is it a portrait? We don't know. He, he does seem to be wearing a contemporary camicia next to his skin to suggest that this mm. is 
a contemporary uh, as, oppo as opposed to the kind of classicizing tunic over the top. So two different indications of, of, of a temporality, beautifully gilded in, uh, with, with gold, of course, um, to suggest uh, lusciousness and sensuality. Yes, I think you pick up on how Leonardo, you know, they share a technique, you've got this fermata approach, but yet they use them to different ends. You know, you say that Leonardo is capturing realities, material realities, whereas that's not what you think Giorgione is doing. I think Giorgio is more, more ambiguous. I mean, he it's it's there's always this sense in, in Giorgione that that the world is kind of invented. Um, the, the, the what is there outside of yourself and outside of your own emotions, feelings, your own senses. Uh, that can be that's not necessarily a positive thing altogether. Um, but it's something I think as a young artist, and I, I am struck by the fact that he's a young artist, mm. and, and I don't know what would have happened had he gone on, you know, beyond his mid thirties. And so maybe with that, you know, I think that uh, you talk about the sfumata of, of the of the young man with the arrow as as being about the expressive possibilities of visual generalization. But then yeah. now we turn to a portrait, um, La Vecchia, which actually has a very different type of technical. Mm. difference you know it has a quite a literal handling of flesh rather than a more generalizing approach mm. so there's it's interesting that we can talk about Giorgione's technique even though actually he does there is quite a range here in what he's doing which absolutely this is why Panofsky said this could possibly be by the gentle <laughs> the gentle man from from Castel Franco this yes. is by Titian of course um, well, you know, um, we, there, there is a range, I, I agree. Um, it has been cleaned, and we're looking at a high-res scan mm. from the Academia of the Post Cleaning, cleaned in 2019. A, a lot of the surface has become a little bit smoother, the flesh has become less creased, actually the, with the effect of making her look a bit younger. I've speculated long and hard on how old I think she is. Is she 60? <laughs> um, you know, hard to say. Certainly it's a dangerous old. game, guessing age, Tom. It's, it's very, very dangerous. I uh, <laughs> wouldn't want to do that. But, um, yeah, this is a test, isn't it? Because we're, we're, we're thinking, well, is this the same artist as these other paintings we've been looking at? Is this the same artist as the, as the young man with the arrow? Um, and what do we think about it? I mean, I feel this painting is playing again on that, that idea of the portrait in a way that maybe the painting on the left by Dürer doesn't. We know this is an allegory of avarice on the left. It's, it's, it's quite clear. The old woman, it says Coltempo, um, but if you look at the way that, uh, that Dürer has approached the skin, uh, it's included this huge great kind of bag of coins. We have one breast revealed as if she was a kind of parody of the Venus Genatrix. Um, it's a kind of parodic image which allows us a quite safe kind of distance moralizing distance from this 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 woman even though the sketch that the flesh is superbly described we remain in a position of power over her i think mm -hmm. and many of these old women images uh, would have been contrasted with images of young richly dressed and deferred men they're, they're often covers for them for example yes. you know capetti or, or yeah Timpani. you know we so you know, that's where, um, where, where I feel there's a difference, um, is that I don't think that Giorgione does that, allows us that kind of comfort. Uh, and, you know, there's an old tradition that this is his mum, quite a specific tradition, um, which I'm quite, I'm half tempted by, I must say, it could be Altadona. Um, uh, but um, it's, 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 a, it's a complex image in the sense that it, it, it's presenting her in the present as if she's right there with us, in a kind of contemporary conversation with us. Um, she hasn't quite kind of hardened into a kind of symbol of avarice or of, 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 of yes, impoverished, yes, suffering, but still suffering. Uh, and believable, I think, as, a, as an individual person. And I think this is, goes back to something which you say um, mm. more broadly about the portraits of Giorgione, which is that they seem far more of, of the immediate moment rather than in the commemorative mode instead. Yes. That, yes. that in a way they are fleeting images rather than yes um, i mean in that way they undo the kind of the kind of eternity promised by the portrait you know this uh, this eternal monument the portrait bust he plays constantly in his portrait like images between the idea that they have this commemorative function 
and then this idea that they're actually in the present alongside you. Um, I think that's probably what I was meaning by that kind of thing. Uh, I find this, this, this painting a, a wonderful work. In some ways, it is the most controversial of my of the people of the paintings that I think you know are by Giorgione. There is there's it's arguably not, but um, there's enough in it around uh, enough, enough ambiguities in it um, in the way we've been talking about. I think to to suggest that this is the same artist, this is the same kind of intelligence at work. Maybe briefly before we move on, we can just quickly um, focus on that 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 lovely kind of scroll of text there and her open mouth. You have this excellent phrase in the book where you say, Giorgione liked to take drapery for a walk. I think that might be my favorite sentence in, in the whole book. <laughs> um, but maybe you can, you know, because I'd never I'd never thought of this as a piece of fabric. I'd always thought of it as a piece of paper. Um, yeah, I mean, it seemed to me pretty obvious that it isn't paper, right? It's not a Catalina. Um, it's, it's kind of part, it's the extended part of her sleeve, mm. um, the top of her sleeve, which would, I suppose, if it turned over the other way, there would be these words with time written on the outside of her sleeve. Um, and it kind of picks up, if we just pull out for a moment, it picks up the scroll and the little little curl at the neck as well yes. so is it like a kind of banderole that's my question are we looking at a kind of prophetic um utterance um you know banderoles were associated with sibyls uh, classical sibyls who uttered prophecies so i traced that a little bit through with this um, I think the recent cleaning has said that has told us that this this edition of this part of the painting was the very very latest um, addition to the work. Um, they discovered that this was a kind of add on, and it wouldn't have surprised me almost as if it were did have that kind of almost residual kind of final. Uh, you know, maybe it was a late idea to do this. And when we get to the Tempest, we can see that late ideas, in a sense, Giorgione mm. kind of does compose as he as he goes along. Um, uh, so yeah, absolutely, yeah, and on. also as part as part of it, you know, it becomes a speaking painting, and it's an old woman who's speaking as yes, well. Geez. And I think that's that's really striking. But we will move on yeah. um, to our, the kind of next area, which is really I'm um, thinking about landscapes and figures of Jordanian. Yeah. This is where we really get um, to the works with, which really have been bombarded with interpretations. And so, you know, when dealing with the works in this chapter, you're you're really engaging with paintings on which so much has already been uh, written. And, and there are so many- It's pretty many terrifying. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the sheer volume of scholarship per year. Um, yeah, this is the, we're just looking at um, the sunset landscape. Yes, I, I called that chapter uh, landscape and figure because I think the figures are quite important in, in these so-called landscapes and uh, particularly in the three philosophers and the, sorry, the three, yeah, the three philosophers and the tempest, the figures kind of in a way kind of interrupt the landscape. They're in a kind of balance with the landscape, which isn't decided. Um, this one in the National Gallery, the so-called Tramonto, the, 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 the sunset, is uh, I think uh, a kind of complex painting, which isn't all by Georgiani, because as Jill Dunkerton said in her mm. kind of cleaning of this, that the St. George is by, is a 19th century or maybe even early 20th century edition of St. George and the Dragon. Uh, and also a couple of the monsters lurking in the pond, particularly that hippo type thing there, <laughs> the lower right, is also an edition. Um, so there's been kind of additions, and I, I was noticing how the additions are, are trying to kind of cheer it up a bit or make it a bit more happening, you know. <laughs> and this is the thing with Georgian. He's very reticent. We'll come back to it maybe when, if we discuss the Georgianesque, because he's a very reticent artist, actually. He doesn't overstate poetics. He doesn't overstate uh, Arcadia. Um, yes, there may be Arcadian associations as... Um, as has long been pointed out in Giorgione's work, but I find that if at very best they're dark Arcadias, and this is a very dark painting. I find this painting a really quite disturbing painting. That's an addition where we're going now, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and maybe and we can maybe we can go to the bit the the element that you don't think that isn't necessarily an addition, which is in the rock there exactly. Yeah. So the figure that we can hopefully just about make out there he is. So yeah. I mean, it, you know, is this St. Anthony in the desert? It probably is. Um, this is possibly a, a, a commission from the Grimani family. Uh, it was possibly bought, made for Domenico Grimani, the great cardinal, great collector, who also owned two images by Hieronymus Bosch of St. Anthony 
in the desert. Um, and we know that the reason why they had these to some extent was because the, the Grimani ran a, an Antonite hospital in, 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 in Venice. Um, it's, it's a painting that's full of doubts. It's full of kind of strange rocks in which figures seem to appear. If you go to the, that, yes, where up there, just beyond St. George and the Dragon, there's a kind of hideous figure who seems to kind of merge out as if one's, one's kind of dealing with one's darkest dreams to some extent. And this kind of idea of the landscape is a projected thing, a projection of emotion and mood. Uh, it's very viewer orientated. Uh, and seems to me a far cry from, um, from the kind of uh, poetic Arcadias of Bembo or Sanazaro from the same period. Yes, it draws on that culture without question, but this is still actually a religious painting. It still has a lot of desert about it. It's inhospitable. The sun is setting, it's distant, and you can't see it. It's far away. Yes, I was interested in, in a way, we, you know, we discussed in the portraits this sense of the fleeting moment or the immediacy, whereas yeah. actually here, particularly with the figures in the rock, it's about, to me, it's about duration. It's about being with the landscape, exploring it, spending time with the image. It seems I think also, for me, it's about being slightly terrified. By it. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's a hostile domain. And yes, these two men are helping one another in an altruistic way, but they're actually being menaced by a a creature that is possibly original, according to Dun Dunkerton. Yeah, there it is, that duck-like creature with mm. the beak. That's kind of coming up. Does the man see it? Uh, I'm not sure, but he's, you know, this is, this, is, this is a world of terrors and potential dark nightmares. Uh, actually, I find quite a number of Giorgione's landscapes to be disturbingly ambiguous and broken up. Uh, and also, you know, not this kind of joyful release into a poetic, um, Arcadia at all. Yes, and I was going to sort of, um, you know, we, we again have discussed this before, but the Arcadian element is interesting because I think I agree with you that they're not a kind of gentle pastoral, um, even mm. here when we're thinking about the Tempest, mm. which is far more sort of green and, and lush, but, yes. you know, there is, a, there is an Arcadia which does contain the dangerous and the terrifying, yes. you yes. know, and I think um, later on when we get to um, when we get to thinking about nudes, you bring up the Hypnero Tomacchio, which is an inherently yeah. Arcadian landscape, but which is full of terrible and awful things as much sure. as it is yes. pleasure. And yeah. so, you know, I think... No, that's a very good point. I, I mean, I, I was careful there not to say that I thought he was turning away from Arcadia. Yes, yes. Just that it, it's what, what elements in it are to the fore and what, what it might contain. Um, yeah, we've, we've arrived at the Tempest and we're looking at some fantastic details of it. Uh, Yes, uh, I mean, I think in some ways, um, what I, I see in this painting, uh, it's very difficult to see anything. What one sees is the interpretation of other people and, and, and the, the, the one's mind just runs along huge cadres of religious interpretations, mythological interpretations, allegorical interpretations, political allegories. I go through a few of them, not all of them by any means, um, in my book. But I, I think, you know, that's what's interesting in a sense. For me, The Tempest is a a painting that again is encouraging projection. It's encouraging discourso. It's owned by Gabriele Vendramin. Uh, it's hanging in his collection. You go into his, uh, his fascinating cabinet of curiosities, of antiquities, and you see this painting. I think it's all about uh, a response to Vendramin. Um, to me, that explains um, quite a lot of the things in it. But, um, you know, uh, for example, the references to Padua in the, in the background uh, city. Um, I think, you know, given that Benjamin owned lots of land just to the south of Padua, that would be a reason for having that. Yes, you've got a, um, you've got a, you've got a, a, a line of St. Mark, but you've also got an upside down cart, which tells you that it's uh, the Carrara uh, family of, um, of Padua. Um, what's the painting about? Well, it's in a sense, it's, it's about um, looking at the painting. <laughs> I think it really is a little bit about that. Um, I, I'm struck hugely by what I've called the erotics of the painting, um, and I know many people have been before, and the young man who's um, described as a soldier and the woman as a gypsy, but uh, by, by Mikhail early on, uh, is he really a soldier? He seems so beautifully dressed. If he is a soldier, then he's, he's, um, he's a very fashionable one. Um, I find that the way he turns his head you know, is, is, 
is, is, is if he's caught sight, he knows about the woman to the right. And there's something archetypal about these relationships. And yet, you know, he looks at her. Uh, maybe he is another afterthought. Maybe he's added right towards the end of the process of painting. Um, there's a re famous reconstruction from the 1930s uh, of the painting based on various things, which has another woman sitting looking out at us rather than him, uh, which would have made it, a, a, and he, she's sitting looking directly at it, just as the woman to the right does. So you would have had a much more, I don't know, Boccaccio style kind of idea of nudes in a landscape. But the, the putting in, it's a, it's a bit, bit of genius to put the man in there and to make him so marginal to the image as if he's another watcher, a kind of surrogate, a proxy for for us at the front. Um, and if anything, though, we're kind of privileged because of course she's looking out with that fantastic turn of the head towards us. Um, that I think the left side of her body repeats to some degree um, the lightning flash above uh, in a poetic way, brings the, the power of her glance out to us. Uh, uh, into, into play. Uh, is that gendered? Yes, it probably is. And I'm still imagining Gabriele Vendramin and his friends, mostly male, looking at this image. Yes, I think, um, I think, it's, I think it's so, I don't know, evocative to think about people in front of these paintings, particularly The Tempest, which is actually really quite a, of a small painting, yeah, but actually how much yeah. you have to enter into it and how many questions it leaves us with. You know, you mentioned that there are so many yeah. iconic, so many elements that seem like they would be iconographically clear, like the broken columns in Giorgione's yeah. paintings, but then somehow they're not. And the same yeah. goes for the interpretations that are attached to these paintings. You know, is she a figure of charity? Well, yes, a breastfeeding woman is a figure of charity, yeah. but often with many more children. So it doesn't quite work. Yeah. You know, all of these interpretations, the second, like they're possibilities. Yeah. Yes, he suggests and then denies. That's yes. very typical. Um, it's not just... Maybe, yeah, go on. Oh, I was just going to move us on to the three philosophers, actually, because I yeah. just want us to have a chance to yeah. talk about this painting as well. And particularly, yeah. actually, how you think the landscape works in a way formally within this picture as well. Yeah, I think it's interesting because you've got these figures at the front and, and, and as with the Tempest, to some extent, you think the figures are going to be dominant over the landscape, but they never quite manage to dominate it. This landscape seems to crowd in on these figures and kind of claim the attention so that you, you know, there's a kind of equality between the natural forms and the human forms, which I think is quite extraordinary. Um, and, uh, you know, the landscape, the more you look at it, the more I found that I, I couldn't arrive at anything settled within it. Uh, this is a painting that's cut down, as we know, on the left by quite a amount. So that huge morass of cave would have been bigger still. Um, and the lighting of the painting um, is, is hard to follow. Um, you know, the sun seems to be away to the left, um, but there it is peeping out, as we're seeing, above the landscape at the back. So how can it be in two positions at once? Um, and, um, you know, are these men with two of whom have these, me these, these measuring instruments, these diagrams based on observation, how far are they actually getting with their measurements? Uh, yes, they, I'm quite happy with the fact that they're philosophers. They seem to be sequestered away from society and reflecting upon nature. But the question remains, how, how far are they getting with their, um, with their measurements? How successful are they being? Is Giorgione simply praising uh, human philosophy and assuming that it's going to open up the mysteries of nature? Or is he actually offering a more uh, critical, um, a more critical um, <laughs> sense of the limitations of human knowledge? I suppose I've, I've kind of gone for the latter. I don't think that that seated man is an antichrist, as somebody once said, but, um, you know, I can't see that. <laughs> That's true. Somebody did say. Um, but, yes. um, um, you know, I do think that as he looks into the, the blackness of the cave, um, and we're not, if, I don't think we're dealing with the platonic allegory here, though we possibly might be, but, you know, we're not getting a return of uh, of knowledge, some fantastic details that uh, Francis is uh, yeah. Francois is showing us. Yes, I'm particularly yeah. struck. I mean, again, I'm, I now have to do a caveat with my own kind of interests. Francois mentioned that I'm interested in the elements, and I really yeah. am struck by, in a way, yes, Giorgione has this generalizing kind of brushwork, but actually, he does pay a lot of attention, in a way, to rock strata and rock formation, mm. and to yeah. natural forms. 
yeah. in particular. But I, I am, you know, yeah. It's a great point. I mean, I think it's a great point. We might need to come to an end, but I think I think um, even in the Tempest, at one level, going back to the Tempest, what a fantastic image of a storm it is, with every colour transformed out of its localness into a reflection of a particular atmospheric condition. Yeah, um, and it is a, it is you know unprecedented in Venetian art. Um, however, interested George Abellini was in landscape and other artists too that kind of transformation of colors away from their given um, was something that maybe again reflects Leonardo to some extent, but again, is something that constitutes this as a picture because the colors in it kind of form it uh, as a kind of independent picture as part of its yeah. attraction. I think. Fantastic. Well, I, I have more questions about the cave, but I think we do need to move on so yeah. that we do have a chance to talk about um, some of the nudes oh. and the nude paintings towards the end. So we briefly just saw um, some of the, well, the fragments really, and the, of that we have of the frescoes of the canal facade yeah. of the German warehouse, which is so fascinating, of course, because it's commissioned by the Venetian state. It's a public mm. work. It's a work by yeah. Giorgione that isn't in this intimate setting. Instead, it's sort of out there in the city. Yeah. Um, and which you definitely described to us as this very kind of striking public work which, you know, Vasari wonderfully says, you know, I've never understood them, you know, yes. no one, no one understands them. And yeah. in a way, I sort of love that quote, because it gets to the heart of, you know, Vasari's almost on your side there, he's being critical, but for you, that's the point. Yes, he, I used, I was very glad you said that, um, but it did, did confirm that there was confusion later in the century about what these things were meant to, what these images were meant to to make. It, they come from 1508, a few years, a couple of years before he died. Who knows what the direction of his work would have been? My sense is it would have possibly got more monumental. Mm. I've talked about Giorgione as having a, an aesthetic of diminution, a, 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 a sense of, of smallness, which is not just, uh, it's not a negative thing, uh, but it's not just about the scale of the pictures either. Was he going to go in a different direction? And I think maybe, you know, his images of the nude tell us that he, he was. Uh, they're not like Michelangelo because they're so, um, so naturalistic, I think. Um, there's parts of the man on the right that possibly uh, owe, owe something to one of the nudie on the Sistine Chapel. But um, overall, I'm struck again by just how, um, how kind of challenging they would be to the viewer, the way these figures look down at a viewer. They're high up on a facade, remember, originally, uh, and how their bodies are not, um, not idealised according to an antique uh, sculpture, uh, the, how, how close to, to nature they look, even through these 18th century classicising versions. Perhaps they were even more naturalistic, you know, yes. before Zanetti got his his eyes uh, got his teeth in, in, into them. And I think particularly, you know, you mentioned the, the toes slightly overcoming the parapet, the hands, yeah. the pointing fingers. And this is something which actually runs throughout Giorgione's pictures is the kind yeah. of subtlety of gesture. But I think as we're going to pick up on details, yeah. let's move on to sure. um, the Venus, because I don't think we can have a conversation about Giorgione without this painting. Um, yeah. So we can close here, but another painting where for you very much so, you know, it mm. is this detail of, not only me, I think quite not a lot. Not only of you, no, but I, think, but I think that you're using it. You're, using it, um, you're yeah. using it in an interesting way to actually say that Giorgione is doing something beyond this prototypical depiction of the ideal female form, that actually he, he's using he it in this a way. Habit. He has this habit. He's quite a radical artist. As, I mean, he, I think he is. He gets to the root of things, but then kind of doesn't give you final meanings. He ends with something that's ambiguous. But um, he penetrates often uh, known iconographies mm. and kind of then... Um, I mean, what he always tends to do is pull you into the present, even though you have an image that could be of eternal beauty, a, a woman lying in a landscape. Um, and the hand with the, with the curved fingers, digits going into that area rather than held away from the body and the sculptures that he would have, he would already have known. The Venus of Modesty is kind of undone with that, that, that ambiguity as to whether she touches and titillates herself. Or, or whether she's she's covering herself, um, and so you know again there's these kind of that's a, that's an extraordinary a kind of moment I think in this image. The thing about this painting is it, it's unfinished when he dies most likely, and it seems to have been finished by Titian, um, who did this on several occasions during his career. Uh, much of the landscape might well be Titian. There was a Cupid that was possibly painted in by Titian, and has since been painted out. 
Uh, and this fantastic swathe of silvery drapery at the front is also Titian. And you can see a different kind of visual language coming into being. I particularly love the way it twists just around the, the, the area that we've been talking about as if to kind of register that kind of excitement that, that one has at that point. Um, again, I project the male viewer, but what's the context of this work? Is it a, a marriage painting for the Marcello family? Was it, well, if it was, if it was, it didn't go to Marcello and he was married in 1507. In 1510, it was still with Giorgione because that must be why it was unfinished. A very good point to end on. But I, and I also think, I mean, what struck me about this discussion, um, you know, of, and yes, and then we have Titian, um, no. is that, you know, if, if this is what is happening with her hand, if she is pleasuring herself, then, yeah. then she is active in this painting. Mm. Yeah. when actually it's often discussed as sort of you know it's objectifying we're passive you know she's passive <laughs> actually she's not you know yeah. and I think that's very powerful and it links back even to um Levecchia where she is speaking mm -hmm. and pointing mm -hmm. to herself that yeah. there is a kind of subjectivity there but um we now get on to in a way the question of Giorgione's influence particularly with Titian and then also you know with, with other artists so yeah maybe let's let's briefly have a conversation about what you about what happens after Giorgione in a way in that moment yes I mean I think I, I, and our good argument against Giorgione being an obscure nobody mm. is just the kind of power of the responses of all the artists around him I mean surely he surely he was even in his own lifetime uh, becoming famous very quickly and, and, and very renowned sought after Titian comes along, this is the painting I was mentioning right at the start, Concert Champetre, which in a sense is the closest to Giorgione. It's the most brilliant version of Giorgione, uh, I think. Um, but it is by Titian. <laughs> um, why? Because in a sense, it kind of does Giorgione more like Giorgione. It, to some extent, it kind of poeticizes Giorgione. I mean, the figures have got more bulk. The figures have got more interreaction. They're, 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 they're billowing drapery. They, they sharply respond to another, to one another. Giorgione doesn't do that between figures, okay? And he still has something of the stillness and isolation, inwardness um, that he had from his own master, who I think was Giovanni Bellini. Um, so I think, you know, straight away with Titian, you're, you're into a different kind of world. The hills roll more, uh, more kind of exaggeratedly. Um, and the whole thing becomes more, uh, more immediate in one sense, perhaps less ambiguous. Um, I, I mean, this is the, the most ambiguous of Titian's early Georgianesque works. Um, so I suppose I think that, um, you know, there's good evidence, even from these early Titian paintings, that Giorgione was somebody uh, who who one could follow, one could one could one could um, could have as a kind of as a model, uh, and you know the evidence is Isabella d'Este, the great page uh, Marchioness of, of Mantua, wanted uh, wanted Giorgione paintings. If you look at the other great figure in possibly in Giovanni Bellini's workshop at the same time, it's Sebastiano del Piombo. Uh, said to have finished some of Giorgione's paintings. By the time you get to this work, it's a pretty big painting. You've got a kind of formal uh, power, kind of Roman power. He's gone to Rome. Uh, he's under the influence of, I think in this case, possibly Raphaelesque models rather than Michelangelo. He's going to go on to Michelangelo. Um, wonderful depiction of Venice in the background, of course, using Giorgione's technique uh, and that softness. Um, but if you look at the foreground figures, um, these are these kind of smoothed out, classicized forms. Um, rhetorically Roman, if you like, um, with, albeit with still with a kind of patina of Giorgione. I think the Georgianesque is a category that's invented in the 17th century. It's possibly Boschini's the first person to use that uh, in 1660s, uh, that term, when people were churning out Giorgione's um, mm. as, and, and making a lot of money from them on the market. So he's become uh, obscured by by the Georgian ethic to some extent. Um, these are the very greatest responses to his work, very immediate, very complex actually in their way, but gradually it becomes separated out and he becomes this kind of model for a series of, kind of romantic cliches of poets and sensuality, et cetera. 
Um, I, I, they obscure him but yes and then we shall close but I think it's a nice I was just going to wanted to quickly it. say that I think it's a lovely moment to end on to say to kind of reassert Giorgione's importance um, through his afterlife um, yeah. and to say that he is clearly a significant artist despite the fact that he is also disappearing um, but I'm right Frank I have my, little, my little books that's it I think I think you know if I put him back on the map in terms of you know uh, as an identity, as a, having, a, having a personality that can be established, then I think I've, I've, I've succeeded in what I tried to do. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tom. I have lots more questions, but I'm going to stop now. <laughs> well, for, for, for the moment anyway, but th th thank you both. And I think it's time to, to open the, the session to questions from the audience. So if you just use the um, raise hand function, and then I'll, I'll uh, ask you to, uh, to unmute. Well, in, in the meantime, I have a question for you uh, about these two Venus. Uh, as you know, there's a kind of debate, well, which is half defunct, it, which was between Rona Goffin and Charles Hope. And Charles thinks these are, I mean, pinups is, is making it a bit flat. But what uh, Rona Goffin insists is that this uh, young lady is preparing herself to receive her husband. And she quotes passages from St. Antoninus. And, Basically, she emphasized that it's marital sexuality. And I think I can believe this with the, the Venus of Orb, you know, which actually I think is called Aurora because she has rosy fingers. Ah. But for, for this, there's, it's much more ambiguous, I think. And I think that, that that's where your book is useful to, uh, to, to blurry the, the semantic possibility of this image. Yeah, that's, that's lovely thought. I mean, I think um, it's interesting that that you know, that if, if Titian does do the landscape in a sense, he's kind of trying to mock up Giorgione at this point. By the time you get to the 1530s, he's he's quite confidently going to put her inside a contemporary palace with some people either getting out or putting away mm -hmm. their clothes. Um, it's interesting too that you know he's the only one that I was able to find who continued with that hand, with that left hand. All the other early responses to the, this painting by Venetian painters. Um, yeah. put the hand away from that area again, you know, re-established the kind of modesty pose or took it away from the area altogether. Because obviously that hand curving in, you know, lays emphasis on what's happening there. It makes it central. Titian, when he comes to the Venus of Urbino, he's got the division of the painting leading you directly down to it. That's That's it. And, yeah. and Lotto puts rose petals where other put uh, the hand, but in fact, you, you were talking of Freudian imagery, and isn't that cut tree in the middle, um, kind of hinting to some form of uh, well, castration, maybe, or anxiety? I don't know, but mm. it's quite conspicuous as the as the middle element in the in the painting. Yes, I like that. With the and it would go with the the tightening of the cloth to the bottom yeah. as well, wouldn't it? It's yeah. kind of lining up those three elements, the center of the. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, how far can one push those kind of things? Um, I mean, I think it's interesting, Gauthier and, 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 and Charles's uh, images are different thoughts about marriage. And, and of course, they come into this earlier painting too. How epithalamic are these paintings? Mm -hmm. uh, are they intended to hang in the bedroom of newlyweds uh, who will then be stimulated in a specific way yeah. to procreate um why you put a dead tree trunk in there to suggest <laughs> at that point I, it might not be such a thing there, there's um, a dead tree trunk but i think there's a fire or at least there's some smoke at the at yeah. the back yeah yeah that's interesting too and i think we're looking at titian paint there this is all titian um yeah, I mean, it, it's to me, it's an interesting one. And there's a lot of gender issues around these images, um, particularly if you go for the idea that the Venus of Abino's head is Angela Sofetta, uh, the, 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 the courtesan uh, superimposed on a body borrowed from um, <laughs> Giorgione. Um, yes. Is that a portrait uh, there of a courtesan, um, not the wife, but the courtesan, and she would also be a stimulus to to sexual, or is the, are these marriage paintings at all? You know, uh, I think Charles doesn't think it's a marriage painting, I'm, I'm right. Okay. So okay. that's well, interesting too. There's a question of what happens at the back, which which suggests, well, it only suggests it's a, it's a bed chamber, but anyway, I don't see questions in the, in the chat. So 
Uh, Talia, you, you had other questions. We can continue the, the discussion a little bit longer if you wish. <laughs> okay, great. Well, um, I think one of the questions I wanted to ask you, which I don't think I got the chance to, was that, you know, you, this, this general point that you're making about the, elusive, the significance of elusiveness in George yeah. O'Neill's work. Yeah. And, you know, you know that I'm also very interested in works that have a kind of openness that I work yeah. on. I work yeah. on the Sacro Bosco, which, yeah. you know, similarly has many, many texts that try to pin it down its meaning. Yeah. And I'm not, I kind of think that part of the pleasure of it, of it is in a way, you know, the word to use your word, the ambiguity. So how mm. much do you feel that this is something that we, that there is, is it is George O'Neill's, but we do also find in other areas yeah. of of Italian art or of well, I think there's some interesting points because it could be far too schematic to say that as some people have that the Renaissance is a kind of ocular centric uh, culture that in which the eye dominates over the mm. lower sense, senses and that unitary meanings are established clarity through perspective anatomy etc the science of art, if you like. I, I don't believe that myself to be uh, enough to explain <laughs> Renaissance culture in general, you know. Um, but it may be that that kind of impulse, you know, a, a kind of a new science, if you like, it, it kind of almost generates its opposite. It generates the space for culturally, for ambiguity. And the discovery of things like the grotesque in, in Rome, um, the whole idea that that you would you could have something that was in a way so very different from from explicatory but but opened up imagination uh, is surely also a, a, a essential to the, to, the, to the Renaissance. Um, so I mean, in a way, I'm as I'm saying that Giorgione's ambiguity, I, as I said at the start, I'm not claiming that he's the only ambiguous artist in the period, but he's one. He goes in one direction in that Venetian context. On the other hand, he's not really, I mean, if you see, you know, Venetian art of the 15th century, I'm thinking mostly of the Bellini's Carpaccio to some extent as being a, a very public and official kind of art that mapped onto a, a, quite, a quite conservative society dominated by a patriciate and a Tridini mm. class uh, and, and public and institutional and state orientated, then, then you, then you, then you've moved a quite a long way with your journey into some new kind of individualized space where you're, in, you're you know where the where the body sometimes the single body is a kind of dominant uh, feature or or, or or a controlling landscape which is is is, is kind of um, beyond the body but is not controlled by by culture to some extent uh, so I think that's a very interesting thing and it takes me back to the idea I have of your journey is being to some extent an outsider artist in Venice. He's not quite as Venetian as he might mm. appear. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think when I think about it too, I'm thinking about, you know, conversations, spaces of debate. I'm thinking yeah. of, you know, awesome. not necessarily yeah. in these works, but, you know, I think often of, you know, gameplay. You mentioned paint the paintings and you, you kind of link it to imprese and, and these, yeah. these yeah. sort of t forms of imagery oh. where... You know, you, things aren't meant to be too obvious. You know, if they yeah. are, they haven't quite worked. Um, you know? I mean, I think um, I think it's I've got her name here, um, Monica Schmidt. I don't think she's here, but um, she's published an article on the Tempest in which she's mm. gone for the Tempest as um, a kind of timpano, timpano, a, um, a, a cover for another painting. Um, and I mean, we're playing around with this. I mean, we're in we're with the great expert, Francois, one of them, on these <laughs> in Prese. I mean, so. To some extent, um, I don't know how far you can push it, but certainly the functions of painting become similar. To reveal an emotional state, nothing more than that. To have paintings that could reflect the emotions and inner life of their patron. Yeah, there's actually an impresa with a tempest. It's in a portrait of uh, Bartolomeo Veneto. Ah. And he has a hat badge and there's a storm in it and mm. he says, Hope is guiding me, and it's a, it's a boat that goes towards a shipwreck. I mean, it's it's quite ironic. But That's it's brilliant. Thank you. Head, it's, it's, <laughs> anyway. Fun to look at, I think. Thank you. Bottle of Yes. I mean, so, you know, small scale, subjectivized imagery. 
be whether it's you know how disturbed it is maybe i think the, uh, the criticism of my approach to Giorgione would be is it would seem to close down scholarship because i'm saying that you know the heart of him is, is is something ambiguous rather than something that can be defined by a good rational scholarly work in a library um so you know um to what extent am i saying that that's going to be a mistake if you try to do it you know well, I think some people would say that the, the purpose of a painter is to make an interesting picture, but the purpose of a man of letter is to spin all sorts of, meet, of meanings from the painting. And that's exactly what they were doing in the Venetian academies. Yeah. If you read the, the books of Anton Francesco Doni, but that's very much part of this culture to see an image and spin some tags, but it has to be a good image to inspire you. And I guess ambiguity is quite useful because the more it's ambiguous, the more you can you can speak. So it's not only addressed to scholarship, but also to active enjoyers of the of the. I think universe. that's right. The only thing I would add to that is, you know, how far are you a historicist, and therefore you believe that the duty of scholarship is to reconstruct a a, a past culture. How far do you believe that Giorgione could still speak to us today, and how far you know how far would he? he'd be in our present, uh, you know, discoursing, you know? Presumably he would be, <laughs> we hope. Um, as long as these paintings are considered to be great paintings, they've got to be able to go on speaking to us. Um, this is the thing about the great artists, right? I mean, it, it's, it's something that they can do, that they can go on speaking. Uh, if, if, if we were just merely reconstructing a posh conversation between Gabriele Vindjamin and his mates in 1509, well, that might be interesting or it might not be, but it would be somewhat archival. Uh, whereas this might be something, you know, to talk about the erotics of a painting, which are, you know, and the way in which he links his paintings to the physical life of, of people, I yeah. think is, 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 you know, this, this <clears throat> century life of people, I think is his lasting value as an artist, which is what makes him go on, worth going on looking at. I think we sort of, you know, I think that's, it's an interesting point and I don't want to, to push back because I think, that in a particularly given a moment in time, we think that some, you know, something that is great is something that speaks to us or captures us, but you have to be careful of changing tastes and artists that have had huge moments of being incredibly unpopular and then sort of being rediscovered at the same, at the same time. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I think that takes us back to the, the problems we, we were outlining right at the start. Yes. About just whenever Giorgione gets popular, there seems to be a point of change mm. in art history. And I'm yes, thinking, actually, that's, that's a good I point that we didn't get to touch on. Yes, yeah, so I think Caravaggio, the fait galant of the early 18th century via Rubens, and all of these are via <laughs> misapprehensions of who Giorgione was and what he painted. Oh, and so then, of course, the pre raphs the pre raphaelite Brotherhood, returned yeah. to Giorgione with Pater. And these moments of vast change, potentially, in, in a prevailing tradition, the, the kind of provocation of the young Giorgione, you know, he died young, he didn't obey the rules. I think that's kind of interesting. I think that might give us a, a sense of who he was, you know? That, 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 that might also give a sense of what Federico Zuccaro said when he saw the St. Matthew of Caravaggio. He said, oh, I only see the manner of Giorgione. And yeah. it might also refer to, um, to a Caravaggio rebellious stance, which you highlight in the, in the context of Giorgione. Yes, for sure. I mean, and the, we're talking presumably in your mind as a self-portrait, um, or as the decapitated head. Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, very yeah. form of these. Yeah. Um, it was argued. I think John Shearman argued that we should we should look back at this this um, image on the right here and see the head of Giorgione as the decapitated head of Goliath. Um, mm. But that's probably not right. I don't think. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see. Okay, well, I think I don't see any more question in the chat. So ah. maybe it's time to uh, to close the, the session. And thank you both very much, Talia and Tom, for some uh, quality time. And it was really a pleasure and a privilege to look at uh, Giorgione with you. So thank you very much both. And thank you everyone uh, who was there. And we'll meet again in uh, January when, when we will uh, look at um, Brogo. So uh, thank you very much and have a good night and a good weekend. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everyone. Thank bye you. Bye.